Hey everybody, I'm Amanda with DevExpress and welcome to today's webinar, Charting Basics, presented by DevExpress CTO Julian Bucknell and DevExpress Technical Evangelist Paul Usher. In this session, they'll take a look at all things charts. Quite often, your project requires some form of visual data representation, and it's not always easy to determine the best chart for the job or how to prepare your data source effectively. Paul and Julian will review the key chart types available across the DevExpress suites and discuss some common case scenarios as well as some creative options. FYI, this session is being recorded and it will be made available on our DevExpress YouTube channel later today. We will also do a live Q&A at the end of this presentation. Just type your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel at any time throughout the broadcast. All right, thank you so much for joining us. I will now hand things over to Paul and Julian. Good morning, guys. Thank you, Amanda, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to our lightning presentation on charting. Good morning, Julian. Good morning, Paul, and uh, welcome, everybody, as uh, Paul just said. Uh, this is going to be a very, um, how can we say, talkative type session. We're not going to be showing any code at all, basically. Well, I think there's a little bit of code on one of the slides, but that's about as much as you write these days, isn't it? <laughs> that's about as much as I do, yes, uh, before somebody else jumps in and says, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> now, just very quickly, Julianne, when we were rehearsing, I had a few minor internet problems with Australia's wonderful NBN. So, should anything go awry, you'll have to take over the presentation. Absolutely, I'm ready, um, just in case. Um, but uh, let's let's jump straight in. Charting basics. Um, essentially, what we're going to be discussing is to say charting is all about visualizing um, the information that's contained in your data. Um, that's that's all it is. It's just a way of showing your user um, some kind of information that can be gleaned from the data. You don't want to present your your poor user with you know, a bunch of values in a spreadsheet, for example, and expect them to understand what's going on, trends or whatever it happens to be, you're, you're basically going to be um, taking that data, creating some kind of chart which will then convey information to the end user. Now, in charting, we, we tend to use um, a Cartesian coordinate system, so see, jumping into mathematics, um, where we have along the horizontal um, axis, we have the x-axis, and vertically we have the y-axis. And in essence, we assume that the y-values are dependent on the x-values. Given an x, you can determine its y from the data. Um, in mathematics, we basically say y is a function of x. In other words, given a X value, as I say, you can calculate or find or discover the Y value. And having the X and Y values, we then have two points, uh, sorry, two coordinates for a single point on our 2D chart. In programming, here's a bit of JavaScript. We could put this as, you know, var Y equals function of X. X is the argument. Um, some calculation in there, you know get it from the array or wherever it happens to be. So, in essence, a chart is a series of points on a 2D surface, and for those 2D points, you need two values, two coordinates, the X value and then the dependent Y value. Brilliant. That's the first thing to realize. Second thing to realize is, us humans, are pretty good at comparing lengths of lines. So we can be given two lines, and we can say, oh yeah, that line is bigger than or longer than that line, um, that line is shorter than that line, or they're roughly the same, or whatever. Um, so the information in, say, bar charts is pretty easy to visualize. Um, so let's, let's go for a simpler bar chart here. And what we have is, yeah, we have a, a three series here, but in essence, we can say, we can look at those green bars, for example, and say, yeah, the one on the left there is way bigger, maybe even twice as big as the next one along. Asia is twice as big as Australia for the green bar. As you can see, 
lines and lengths tend to be fairly easy to visualize and to um, glean some extra information from without having to revert back to the actual data values, the ones which have been displayed inside each of those bars. So it's quick and easy. On the other hand, or oh, the other way of you know, drawing um, um, uh, or understanding line uh, lengths is to use a line chart. We'll, we'll be looking at that in a moment. So as you can see here, uh, the, um, the lines show extra information, if you like, uh, through, if you like, a trend. So that green line is trending quite quickly upwards, whereas that blue line is yeah, it's going downhill, um, but very slowly. And you get that kind of extra information that you probably wouldn't get from just reading the data points. Oh, the values of the data points. So the lines give you that way of saying, yeah, that's, that's pretty big, that's pretty small, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, humans tend to be pretty bad at estimating uh, differences in area. And we jump straight into that favorite of mine, not um, our inner... Uh, um, our internal joke here between Paul and I is I hate bar ch um, pie charts and here we have a pie chart and it's kind of hard to see uh, even when we've ordered them you know which pie slice is bigger than the next pie slice and how big it is is that blue pie, blue pie slice twice as big as that red one I, yeah it's kind of hard to say and so we tend to rely on extra things like the hover tip or, you know, the actual display of the percentages. After all, a pie chart is basically displaying a series of percentages from your series data. So, you know, the other's value there is 55%. And, you know, Australia, as Paul is known to pull out, is 5%. But you can't really tell that from... Um, the actual size of the pie itself. So, you know, it's one of those those things. Pie charts tend to be used a lot. I, I, I admit I tend not to like them um, because of this, this very problem. I think this data would, for example, be better served by a bar chart or something like that. Another um, uh, way of wondering about, you know, what size areas there are is a bubble chart. Actually, a bubble chart is kind of interesting because it's kind of a representation of um, you know, 3D data. You have not only the x-axis here, which is the time, and the y-axis here, which is the budget, but each of those bubbles uh, defines a third uh, value, uh, the, the grossing uh, of, of each of these films, the, high, uh, the grossing, the revenues from the film. And as we can see, that, that green blob, uh, sorry, bubble, um, is very big uh, compared with the red uh, bubble to its lower left. But we can't tell from that, is it twice as big? Maybe not twice as big, um, maybe three times as big? You can't tell from the area of the bubble. It's just, you're just able to say, hmm, big bubble, small bubble without actually getting any kind of relative size or relative values and all that kind of stuff. So it's a great way of visualizing stuff, but don't expect to see um, uh, more information being gleaned from, you know, if you like, bubble sizes or pie slice sizes and all the rest of it. I think, Julian, at that point, the, the whole thing there is that if you're looking at a chart like this one, it's going to grab your attention. It's going to be, boom, I want to get more information about it. It's not that I want to look at this and be so accurate with the data points that everything is, is in my face. And the same with the pie chart, that there's certain elements, if we look quickly back at that pie, we can see straight away that you know, the volume of work Paul does over here on the right versus you, know, you on the left, it gives us that immediate result. So if I want deeper information, I can drill into it. 
Agreed. I mean, that's all I'm trying to say here is, um, yeah, sometimes with these area type um, charts, you really need the extra information, the data to be displayed alongside either with, as we have here, um, each individual pie is labeled uh, or through a hover, um, you know, capability. We'll see lots of hover capabilities. So in essence, you get the immediate impact of the visualization of the chart boom, oh yeah, that looks interesting, I really need to drill into that, and we'll be talking Ooh. about that. Um, uh, but, you know, it's it's a case of um, yeah, making sure that your users can still get at, if you like, the data underlying the chart, underlying the visualization. Now, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is... Um, the x-axis in business charting tends to be called um, the argument axis, the arguments uh, for the chart, and the y-axis tends to be called the values. So for each argument, we have a value, and that's uh, uh, multiplied over the set of uh, x um, arguments um, produces a series, essentially. Now, the x-axis, can uh, the values can either be discrete or continuous. By discrete, I mean, you know, they're separate, distinct values. So here we have our bar chart again, and we have, along the x-axis, we have five distinct values, the values being the continents, essentially. So we have Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. So it's not a continuous uh, uh, set of values for the x-axis. They are individual, distinct values. They're discrete and the interesting thing about, uh, if you like, discrete values is bar charts tend to be a, a really nice way of displaying that data. Um, you, you, you understand that, you know, you're not looking for, you know, uh, averages between different bars or anything like that. You're just basically saying, is it going up, is it going down, um, and so on and so forth. And the interesting thing about it, here we have a financial chart. Um, um, and uh, the financial chart essentially is a set of discrete uh, x-axis values, uh, one per day. And here we have a, a candlestick chart, and we're showing um, the open, close, uh, high, low type um, information for each of those days. Now with this, yes, the x-axis values are uh, distinct, but it produces a kind of continuous uh, variation. We can see trends with this kind of information because there are so much um, or so many discrete points on the chart. So we see when you know prices going up, prices going down, and how quickly and all that kind of stuff. We're seeing those trend lines and obviously we can zoom in. And here we have an example of where color is interesting. Um, the color of each individual point shows whether the, um, um, the stock price uh, went down during the day or went up during the day. So down is red. Uh, bad news, danger, danger, and black is good, uh, moving up, um, so you're getting to be more profitable. Um, financial charts are a special type of charts, I must admit. Uh, with a lot of charts, you can basically, you know, almost toss a coin, decide which chart you're going to display for the user, but financial users, traders, and all that kind of stuff, they want their charts in a certain way, and they have to be in that way. Um, so, yeah, this particular example of the candlestick chart. Um, where was I? We're going to take a look at some other chart types. Okie dokie. Um, the other thing to note, yes, let's go back to the, uh, the bar chart uh, example. Now, what we have here is, yes, it's a bar chart, but we have three series. And I mentioned this earlier on. A series is essentially a set of distinct points uh, on the, uh, the chart. So here we have three series, one for 2016, one for 2017, one for 2018, uh, colored differently. Uh, at this point, I start um, 
you know, warning everybody about uh, it's nice to have color in your charts, uh, but be aware if you're trying to express some kind of information through color, you have to be aware that, um, a, you know, fairly large proportion of people in the population are color blind. So be warned if you are going to try and express some kind of information through color, um, then you may find that some people cannot see the difference. Here, it doesn't matter what the colors are. There's no interest in why 2018 happens to be green. Uh, don't know. Um, so the, as I say here, it's a um, discrete x-axis. Each element or each value of the x-axis has three uh, possible values for each of the three years. So the three series being shown in the same um, bar chart. Next. Now here's a kind of interesting thing. Um, what we're showing here, yes, it's an artificial um, example, but it's showing in real time uh, three line charts. Um, and so what we're able to do here is not only to show that, yes, it was a line chart, um, but we're actually updating it in real time, or uh, well, at least the, the frequency spectrum down there as we're you know, going through the, um, um, the audio uh, on the top two channels there. But they're all line charts. Um, it's just a very neat way of uh, showing this kind of information. Not necessarily a, a kind of business charting example, I would say, but um, certainly shows the kind of things you can do with um, line charts as, as an example. Just before, next I switch to the next, just before I switch to the next yeah. chart, Julian, one thing to note is that the, the chart examples we're showing you at the moment are wind forms. I'm going to jump to WPF shortly. But we've got charts across all of our major platforms as well. So here we're seeing high volume data updated in real time. Next, we want to show you some colors. <laughs> so back to the color problem here. But in essence, this is a standard line chart no real um, you know, fab thing about it, except that we're implying some extra information through the color. And obviously what we're showing here is mean daily temperature, as it says. So we're showing the higher temperatures in a red and the lower temperatures in a blue. So to kind of convey the how hot it is or how cold it is information, as well as you know, just the standard line chart. Um, it's a uh, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, here it it kind of works. Just I, I don't know. Don't go overboard on it. I'd say. Here we we're showing exactly the same thing, um, but with an area chart instead. So we're coloring um, the different areas of the chart according to their upper temperature or lower temperature. It's kind of a fun thing to show. Um, and I. I Ever since we produced this, I'm trying to think of a business use case for it, but uh, you may find something. Next, I want to jump over to the drill down functionality that you can find inside some charts. Now, this example, which is based on a stack bar, which we're going to go through and take a look at in a little more detail in a second, it's not saying that you have to use the charts in these sequences, but it is a great example of how you can use multiple charts, different charts, to represent other information coming through. We've got this stacked bar, which has obviously been rotated. I know that the X and Y problems causes Julian to go into a bit of a spin, <laughs> but that's OK. Yeah, as mathematicians, uh, we like our X axis along the bottom and the Y axis up and down the side. But uh, OK, we just flipped it you know, 90 degrees, as it were, or no, it would be uh, a mirror rotation through 90 degrees. But anyway. Now, I know that as a kid, I could never remember which of the axes went which way <laughs> until somebody said to me, Paul, X is a cross. And as you draw an X, it's literally a cross. You can't get it wrong then. Boom. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. 
Yeah, so all, all that all that money mum and dad spent on schooling right there. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Here we've got a sales division for DevAV West. And as I click on here, we can see that it opens up a stacked area chart. And the stacked area chart essentially says each of those bands is a separate um, series. The bands do not start at the bottom, apart from the lowest band. Um, the bands are stacked one on top of the other. And as you can see, what essentially that's showing is, yeah, you can see the total, um, what are we doing, sales. Total um, sales at the uh, on the top uh, value there, which is roughly, what, uh, 14K or something like that. But the hover tip is actually showing you the, how it's broken down for each of those um, area bands underneath and you know and drilling down even further you can see individual an individual chart so what we're trying to show here is um, not necessarily different chart types but the ability to use um, charts as a kind of uh, almost like a dashboard effect where you've you're presented with some kind of visualization of information and you want to drill down to understand uh, where that information is coming from. As Paul mentioned, this is a stacked bar chart. So, whoops, as he jumps. Back to the stacked bar charts. Not that one, though. I want this one. Yeah. So... The interesting thing here is not only we're we showing um, uh, essentially population size, uh, well, male population size uh, for different countries. Um, so you can see the individual bars there and say, oh, yeah, the United States is you know, quite a lot and UK is you know, quite short and all the rest of it. And you have some kind of visualization of um, you know, the differences in length of each individual bar. But the bars are actually subdivided into, if you like, sub-bars by age. And here we can get some more information, if you like, displayed to the user, um, at least in a kind of proportional sense. Um, so, for example, if you look at Mexico and Japan there, you could say, wow, proportionally, there are way more older men in Japan than there are in Mexico, as a proportion, as a percentage. Um, you know, roughly the same population, but, you know, lot more older people. And the same thing, you can't really do the same, say, between Japan and the U.S., because proportion-wise, yeah, yeah it's, it's hard to visualize. So at that point, you'd be thinking about if, if they really do want to see proportions, then you know, show some kind of hover tip with percentages and all the rest of it. But that's a, a stacked bar chart. Area views are, are kind of fun. Um, you're basically showing a line chart and then um, coloring in the um, area underneath the line. Um, uh, different colors and all the rest of it. Um, it, it kind of works, and we we do a um, you know nicer rendition here, um, you know, to show a, if you like color depth. So we have the blue in the background and red in the foreground, and then you know, where they cover each other, it's a slightly different color. What we have here is a, a stacked area graph. It's a spline. All the spline says is we. Um, basically smooth out the line of the um, instead of having you know a jagged line we smooth it out for you and all the rest of it um, that's the other thing about um, uh, line graphs or area graphs is you they go well with continuous data along the x-axis because then you can start estimating in between the actual data points that you're given um, the this particular one is a banded um, view, if you like. Um, the each band is stacked on top of the one underneath. So the uh, height of each band at each particular x value is um, not from the x axis itself, apart from the lowest one, but from the previous band. So if you look at 2014, for example, yes, we see that. 3.665 million 
dollars in sales from North America and Europe is 3.88 million dollars and Australia is 2.01 million dollars and if you add them all up it makes roughly 9 and 9.6 9.7 or something like that um, so it's it's a nice interesting way of um, um, showing information like this continuous information like this um, but um, uh, be warned um, if you're showing um, uh, an area chart elsewhere and then a stacked area chart somewhere else, the user could get confused about, you know, where to compare uh, these lengths, um, these vertical lengths. Do they compare from the x-axis itself or the previous line or, or where? Just be aware. <laughs> so now let's talk 3D for a second. Now, <laughs> I'm, 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 okay. We agree I'd have it's to, not 3D. <laughs> it's, it's a cheat. That, that kind of chart is, is a bit of a cheat. Um, it looks sexy. It looks sexy, but, you know, as you rotate it around, um, the, the visual comparison of areas becomes way more difficult. Um, I mean, that's the the worst case as it were <laughs> right <laughs> on the edge but you know as you rotate it around it becomes harder to actually visualize which area is bigger than which you know which sorry pie slice is bigger than the next pie slice and all the rest of it it's it's kind of nifty kind of looks good and as you can see your user can then just rotate this around and play around with it but it's it's not 3d it's enhanced 2d all right, so let, let's let's talk 3D. Real use cases for 3D charts. Three, uh, 3D charts means there are three dimensions, so each point is defined uh, in three-dimensional space by an X, Y, and Z or Z coordinate. And here we have, you know, the uh, highest luminosity stars, and we're talking about distance from um, us the earth or the sun i should say um so we uh, as we point in one particular direction uh we need uh we're defining this on the surface of a sphere so we need um three dimensions um a much better one is the one that uh, paul really likes i could spend all day looking at the next one <laughs> Here we're actually showing a, you know, if you like a, a even more proper 3D chart. We're we're showing a surface uh, which is being regenerated in real time, and the surface is, you know, in three dimensions essentially. So, I'm still trying to work out where I could use this in a business sense. So it looks really nice in a kind of a uh, statistical or even mathematical um, or even physics type sense. Well, I'm, I'm uh, thinking topography straight up, but it, it does actually look like movement of my bank account on a weekly basis. <laughs> so you have more than one person accessing your bank account? Welcome oh. to fatherhood. <laughs> but yes, this, this obviously, okay, it's um, real time, but it is showing a surface um, projected onto a 2D um, screen, essentially. And that's more like the 3D I'm, I'm, I'm used to. Yes, there are three coordinates to every point. Talking coordinates, we've been talking Cartesian coordinates. It's time to you know, think about um, radar views and polar views. Now, the interesting thing about this particular chart is if you could display it certainly as a, quote, standard Cartesian type chart, you know, starting off with January on the left-hand side and ending up with December on the right-hand side. But this is showing you how temperatures vary throughout the months. And you don't just stop at the end of the year. We presumably go have to wrap around in some sense to go back from December to January. So displaying it as a circle in polar coordinates makes more sense for this type of data, uh, where you have the months, and, you know, after you finish December, you go back to January again and all the rest of it. They're called polar coordinates because basically you uh, plop down your origin, your center point in the middle of the uh, uh, page or the screen or whatever. Um, 
and you measure each point on the chart in a polar fashion which is an angle from either the vertical or the horizontal and the length of the vector from the origin. So if you look at say October there which is the horizontal line to the right um, we're showing that that point is well it's at uh, 270 degrees from the vertical going anti-clockwise and it's that length away from the origin uh, which is what six degrees or no seven eight degrees and uh, you know similarly the next one out the blue one is you know same angle uh, from the vertical 270 degrees um, I'm just about to start using radians just to prove I did mathematics and um, the length of the vector at that particular point is you know, 15 Celsius there we go Fun fact, so, Julia. Fun fact? Fun fact, all you need to do is create a simple array of the argument and the value and the smart boffins that their express will chart it for you. <laughs> you just have to choose the chart, indeed. But per the charts, per the charts um, or radar charts, um, same kind of thing, they use polar coordinates instead of your normal X, Y, um, Cartesian coordinates, that's all. Ooh. So what we want to just look at here is the different elements that you can combine with your charts. So you've got a number of options with legends. You've got the ability of turning legends on and off, so in this case here. So well, having your legend control the elements on your charts, you've got that interactive nature. And you can mix and match the different legend modes and marker modes as to what you're doing with your chart. In this case, you can also see that we've got two panes, one of an area and the other of a line. Talking of panes... Uh -huh. I wasn't going to make any reference to you, Julian, I promise. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to switch to the grid pane layout. And this is a great example of where you can use multiple charts of differing types they're all bound together. So as I move the, the cursor here over this user traffic, you can see the different points. You can see what's captured in the pop-up. You can also see in all the other charts that are in uh, different panes where that information is also relevant. So as I move over here, we can see that we've got a spike in HTTP error codes at that point. So that can be quite handy. So, in fact, using panes is like, um, uh, I was going to say, a poor man's dashboard in, in a sense. You're essentially displaying a whole bunch of different charts on the same surface, and um, you're linking them all together. And, uh, and we have different types of charts being shown here. We have line charts and bar charts. It uh, works really well. Two other quick examples. This is showing how you can actually have information from two different sets of scales or two different series in essence, one shown on the left with our primary and the secondary on the right. And the scales obviously are very, very different. And again, all this is about is helping the user visualize what information is being displayed. Um, so having you know, essentially two series, same x-axis, but we'll be able to show um, trend lines if you like they're going down but the the blue trend line is going down slower than the red trend line and all that kind of stuff but because they're measured in different um, um, uh, values um, then you have to have these different uh, axes for the y-axis another example is when you've got data that really doesn't scale well or work well with itself. So here we've got the mass of planets, so we can see that Jupiter is sitting all the way out at 318 versus Venus at 0 0.82. Mercury barely even hits the scale. When you, it's not a very appetizing grid or chart to look at. So what you can then invoke is this scale break function. 
And what we're trying to do here is to say, okay, all the information, all the data, if you like, is important to visualize, um, but we're going to try and display it on the same bar chart, but we're going to have to, if you like, break up the y-axis um, and strip out, you know, a chunk of the chart. Um, and we show that through this jagged line, basically. So you, the user gets some impression that, oh yeah, this you know, Jupiter is is really, really heavy, uh, or massive, I should say, versus Mercury, which is, even in this particular scale break chart, um, <laughs> pretty low down there. So that's just a, another way of displaying the information, um, but you know, making sure the user understands that um, we have to you know, chop up the chart in a certain way so that they can see it all. Now we've talked about a, a number of different chart types. We've looked at examples of those and where they might be useful, where stacking would be useful. One of the things we want to finish with is looking at different data elements. We've got a, a simple example here showing a grid representing all of the data from the chart that's above. Now before I jump into this, one of my favorite things when I'm working with charts is to actually design a data class specific to help get the best results for that chart type. I now understand that that's not going to suit all needs. If you've got millions and millions of rows, you're not necessarily going to want to be pulling through those to push them into the, a specialist of the class. But what I've found over the years is that it's a great way, instead of spending a lot of time trying to massage uh, uh, different things into arguments and especially if you're dealing with things like polar charts or spider charts it's really easy just to set up a class make it a collection and then pass that once you're populated pass that through to your chart control it saves a lot of messing around in the example we've got on screen we've got this raw data so company product income month and revenue and we can see on the right hand side that I can change the actual series data member. And if you think back to earlier, Julian was talking about series, that's represented here, so these different color bars. And instead of being company, I'm going to say that the series should be product. And we can see that the bars will change. Or I might say that the series is going to be by a month. So instead, we've got our each month represented inside the argument data value. Remember that the argument data member or the argument is the x-axis, so here I can switch it back to company. And just by having even this very simple data structure, I've got a lot of ability to allow the end user to start looking at different aspects and visualizing that data slightly differently to get maybe the results that they want. Julian. Okay. Um, the only one we haven't really looked at was um, the Gantt chart. We kind of skipped over it, which is kind well, of a weird one. <laughs> that's the question is, is it, is it a chart or isn't it a chart? <laughs> it's, it's not a chart in the same sense of the charts we've been looking at uh, up to now, I'd have to say. But we're all familiar with, I'm sure we're all familiar with Gantt charts. You know, you've got a project, you define the various aspects of that particular project, how long they will take. And obviously you're tracking how long they actually did take. And so the Gantt chart is a kind of neat way of uh, encapsulating that kind of data in a kind of flow across the, across the screen, as it were. Um, when you need a Gantt chart, it's, uh, you really need the Gantt chart. And when you don't, it's like, oh, okay. With that, what we might do is switch through and have a look at any questions that have been coming through. And there have been quite a, a well, quite a few. Um, Scott G says, is there a way to export the chart? Yes. In fact, we're looking at it right there. There's an export button. Oh, you are. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even realize my, my screen wasn't updating. So. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yes, there is, there is an export, the way to export in all of our uh, chart modules. Um, 
So, da, 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 da. do you have any plans to provide an end-user chart configuration tool? For example, you have grids that display a lot of detail, but it would be nice to have, uh, be able to allow users to select a few fields for the legend, the values, the series, etc., and display a chart, and perhaps it allow the end user to further customize the resulting chart. The answer is, it depends on the platform. The dashboarding, the dashboarding components allow that already, and one of the one of the great things with our stuff, obviously, we do have an end user chart uh, designer available in uh, WinForms. WinForms. Yeah. Absolutely. So it depends on the um, on the platform to be honest. Um, um, I get what you mean George. It'd be nice. Uh, uh, I, 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 as Paul mentioned this is encroaching into our dashboard area. Um, so it's a uh, oh look there's a designer. Oh, yes, we're in WinForms. Yes, of course there is. <laughs> so there's a lot of information that can be then played with by your end users. Uh, in some cases, there's too much. So, But of course, all of the objects and properties can be exposed if you want to add your own panel anyway, because we have our properties panel, and there's lots of customization you can do yourself. Indeed. <clears throat> Any plans for your pivot grid control to be a data source of these charts? Um, yeah, I think we have an example on the WinForm side already. So the pivot grid. Let me bring up there, we have in the data binding, we have our pivot grid charting. Yep, so definitely. Again, there's probably different ways of doing it for each of the platforms. Um, yes, we've been trying to be generic enough so we're not really talking platform specific stuff here um, uh, we do have charting for asp.net nvc um, asp.net core um, dev extreme um, and even xamarin so yeah um, but they each have different capabilities and expressed in different ways slightly um, there's a question here about the real-time data stream. So yes, we have, in fact, we have a number of clients who use the charting controls in medical scenarios. But here's an example of a real-time stream. In fact, it's reading my, the clock off my system. Really? Oh, okay. Very nice. Uh, what else have we got? <coughs> is the chart component ready for .NET Core 3? Uh, to be honest, don't know yet. Uh, .NET Core 3 is not out. And um, obviously, we're working really hard to get everything that we have working with .NET Core 3. Um, WinForms especially is difficult, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, if you are using .NET Core 3. So I don't particularly want to comment too much on that at the moment. Take a it look might at work. Take, take a look at the blogs. We, we've got a lot of updates. A lot of the teams are posting uh, what's happening in that sp space. So really, you've got access to some really early access components for different platforms, including the new stuff for .NET. I myself am a big Blazor fan, so I'm constantly on at the team for all the stuff happening in the world of Blazor. Oh, that's interesting. Habib says, Julian B at devexpress.com does not work. Um, it does. Honest. Really. Now, of course, okay. <clears throat> there, there is also a designer for WPF. Um, there's a link that we will post, which will be posted for everybody, on the chart designer for WPF. So... But I'm pretty confident, well, again, you've not we've not touched on every individual platform, but a lot yeah. of the functionality is carried for. And I've got to, I want to make a call out to the WPF team because I absolutely love that 3D chart. So, well done, guys. Okay, uh, George asks, where can I get the demo you've been showing? I would like to see the code behind a few of the charts. Basically, what we've been showing is the standard demo center that we have when you install our product or you install the trial. Uh, the demo center works. 
And the thing about the demo center is all of the code for the demos in the demo center is available when you install the product. So I was just using everything under, we're going into the individual platform and then choosing charting from there. So yep. the demo center is a great place to find out. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't have, you know, one of our subscriptions or the subscription we're talking about, then certainly just use the trial and you get all of the source code for the demos with the trial anyway. So you can see how things work, how things are put together, how things are joined up and all that. One question in here about ASP net charting. So I'm just going to see if I can spin up a demo. Never do things you haven't planned for, Paul. <laughs> what? <laughs> of course not. So we're just going to watch Paul's screen here. <laughs> There's some again. If you just from looking at the in the list on the left, you can see uh, we've got the drill down capabilities. We've got the segmented colorizer. We've got histograms, bubble charts. You've got the trend indicators. Every pretty much everything we, we've been showing you is available for ASP.NET as well as DevExtreme. There are a couple of minor name differences between DevExtreme and ASP.NET um, for, for things like the polar chart. It's called a spider chart, I think. Um, but everything that you can see, including uh, the ability of interacting, changing. Yeah, and it's... the important thing about ASP.NET or MVC or um, DevExtreme is you can go online to demos.devexpress.com and play around with them yourself. And we show the code underneath each, um, as we're showing here at the moment, under each demo we have the code that's uh, used to generate that particular demo. And that's, uh, I'm showing web form, but it's, it's available for MVC as well. Okay. Any questions, Julian? No, I think that's about it. That's about well, it. Thank you again for sharing the presentation, Mr. Bucknell. And thank you, Paul, for being there and you know driving the screen. <laughs> wow! <laughs> you can feel the love. <laughs> you can feel the love, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you, Paul and Julian. Uh, you can check out devexpress.com slash webinars for all of our previously recorded content and to register for any upcoming sessions. And like I mentioned previously, today's webinar will also be available on our DevExpress YouTube channel. Uh, I just posted the link to our channel in the chat box. And that is it for this one. Thank you so much to Paul and Julian. Thank you all for joining us. And of course, thank you for choosing DevExpress. Bye-bye.